In this video, we've got kind of a wild one. It's a combination of a couple techniques I've used in the past, but the result of the combination is something that I've never quite seen before. It was one of those times that when I had the idea, I had to drop everything, run to the shop, and start building. So I started by designing this kind of bean-shaped object, kind of just a random organic shape. Then I used some of the parametric design approaches I've talked about in the past. I sliced this thing up to get this sort of base structure. And I thought this type of table base would look really cool if it's embedded in a translucent resin top. I think being able to see these slices through the clear resin top is just gonna look super cool. I think we just gotta drop everything, head down to the shop and build this. While I'm cleaning up the edges on those plywood slices, I gotta ask, for those of you out there that don't like CNC's and are always commenting that it's not real woodworking, was the 80s montage enough of a distraction that you weren't thinking that while you watched it? I'm mostly kidding here because at this point, I hope folks realize that when used properly, the CNC opens up things that really wouldn't be possible or would be much more difficult to execute with traditional woodworking tools. And what is traditional really? At one point, a table saw or a power circular saw were new technology. People probably said that a circular saw was cheating, not real woodworking because you're supposed to cut it with a handsaw. But I digress. For those who wanna know what's actually going on in the build, I'm applying a water-based polycrylic to the slices to add a bit of durability while keeping the light color of the plywood. Next up, we're making the spacers that are gonna separate the plywood slices and we're cutting these out of two by fours. Why two by fours? Well, when I designed this, I wasn't paying attention to the spacing between the plywood slices and it came out to the nice round number of 0.81 inches, too thick to use plywood for the spacers. Rather than redesign the whole thing, I decided to use the bandsaw and planer to get the two by fours down to 0.81 inches to use as stock material for the spacers. But then it was back to the CNC to cut the donuts out of the two by fours. And if you're wondering how the donuts are gonna work to hold everything together, well, I think that'll be much more clear when you see the thing assembled. For now, let's just focus on the fact that they're donuts and there is a definite food theme with this table. My initial inspiration for the design was thinking that the iconic Chicago bean would look really cool if inverted and used as a table base. When I shared progress shots on Instagram, some people commented that it looked like a potato or a peanut. So at a minimum, donuts are right on the food theme. Next, I needed to paint the donuts black so they'd kind of disappear between the plywood slices, but I needed to leave the tops and bottoms of the donuts bare so we could apply wood glue later. So I came up with the idea of sliding all the donuts onto a dowel. This would hide the tops and bottoms, and then I could just paint all the donuts at once. Maybe this was the obvious solution, but for some reason I thought this was clever and was kind of proud of it. You and want a cookie? Yes, yes, I would like a cookie now. We got everything ready. I am ready for the glue up. We're gonna do half the base at a time and I'll explain the process we're doing as we go. So I will turn it over now to voice over me. Thanks on camera me. So if you weren't quite understanding how the slices of the base were gonna be attached to one another, this is where it all should come together, figuratively and literally. When I was designing Infusion 360, I made three holes all the way through the slices. So when I slide a 5 8 inch dowel through those holes, all the pieces will be aligned perfectly in the bean shape. And that's where the donut shape of the spacers come in because the donuts fit over the dowel to maintain even spacing between the slices and using wood glue between the spacers and the slices makes the whole structure super solid. So if you weren't quite understanding how the slices of the base were gonna be attached to one another, this is where it all should come together, literally and figuratively. Yeah, 
So for the end cap, we got three dowels in here, one spacer because there's not room for all three spacers around the dowels, and it should just slot right into these holes. You know, I'm really, to be honest, those dowels stick out like a sore thumb. Hmm. Okay, before we glue that in, I think of something. I think we got a plan here, so you only see the little black spacers and keep that visual separation between all the segments. We're just gonna take some dowels, plug these holes, and we can take another dowel in the middle of the one donut that's here, drill a new hole right in the middle, and use that to attach it, and then uh, I think that'll look a lot better. So Mike just checked his phone and then ran off something. I'm not really sure what's going on. Dude, you are never gonna believe the sponsor we got for this video. You know how I love to go scuba diving with sharks? Well now, I'm gonna get to go surfing with sharks. We got a surf shark sponsorship. Uh, Mike, a VPN is a virtual private network. Hold on. Okay, so I guess Cam is right, but Surfshark VPN is still gonna be super useful for me at home and while I'm traveling. My dive trips take me to places like Indonesia, Galapagos, Bahamas, French Polynesia, and more. Sometimes on a rainy day, I just wanna stream a movie from Netflix. But unfortunately, there are some countries where my US Netflix subscription just doesn't work. This is where a VPN comes in. I can log into a VPN and appear virtually as if I'm in the US. This way, I can enjoy my favorite streaming service regardless of where I am in the world. And perhaps most importantly, a VPN protects your privacy and personal information while you're online. When you're using Surfshark, everything you do online is encrypted, so essentially it looks like gobbledygook to anyone who's trying to snoop on your online activity. One other thing I really love about Surfshark is that it has a web browser extension. You don't need to install a separate standalone application. Recently, I was shopping for some Live Edge slabs for an upcoming project, and when I went to check out, I could click on the web browser extension, open the VPN, and make sure that all my personal information was protected, all that without even having to switch tabs in my web browser. As for cost, well, here is something mind-blowing. Surfshark allows for unlimited sharing of your account. You can share one account with all your friends and family, so each of you is paying less than a piece of gum to protect your privacy. And right now, you can also get three extra months free when you head to surfshark.deal slash medustrial or the link in the description below and use the code medustrial. So if you aren't using a VPN to protect yourself online, you owe it to yourself to check out Surfshark. Thanks Surfshark for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to it. The shape of the resin top is exactly the same as the table I built in the last video, so I'm simply reusing the form. Go check that video out if you wanna see more details on it. But for this one, we can go straight to the epoxy. Right, so see Everything's set up perfectly level, it's go time. Usually I'm super nervous, and for some reason today, I actually feel kinda confident that this is gonna go well. We just did something similar, it went well a few days ago. Still, cross your fingers. Hopefully I'm not getting overconfident. Since I want a translucent blue top, I just used a few drops of blue pigment in the epoxy. And while we're doing this pour, let's talk about pigment. Because there's a lot of controversy about epoxy, but at the end of the day, epoxy itself, you can see right through it. It's perfectly clear. It's almost like air or water. But we as makers and woodworkers add pigment to it, and that pigment really, if you think about it, is the cause of a lot of the controversy. When you see some tables where these like metallics and sparkly pigments are mixed in the epoxy, when you combine that with this beautifully figured wood, you've got two dramatically different color palettes with different patterns and swirls. It's like pizza and ice cream. They're both delicious on their own, but putting ice cream on your pizza, not so much. I personally feel that when you have something beautiful from wood, the epoxy should be simple and just help to highlight the wood to complement it. I generally like clear, black, white, solid colors of epoxy, or in this case, a simple transparent blue. No sparkles or anything like that. All that said though, design is a matter of opinion and that is just my opinion. So if you disagree, leave a comment. You're welcome to yours. I gotta make sure we... 5 hundredths of an inch. I don't want to mess with it anymore. So now I'm just going to come back like every 30 minutes, check for bubbles, give it a quick blast, and then that's it. And then we just let it let it rest. And let's touch the ground and do that. Just make sure that static will suck into the epoxy like mad. Here 
we go. All right. First test peels away nicely. Let me just, I'll just finish this. Okay. Hey. Oh, dude, that is cool. So cool how it changes color. Like it makes the plywood look turquoise. I knew it was gonna be cool, but like just having the way that the way that the gradient comes through. The steps after the build here are gonna be a bit different than typical epoxy projects in part because I made the form to basically the exact shape that I wanted the table to be and also because I'm gonna be trying a couple new things. Since it came out of the form in basically the shape that I want it to be, that means that there's no cutting the epoxy down to size. I just had to sand the tops and sides to remove the textures that were left on the surface from the melamine and the wood grain pattern in the garden edging. There was also a little divot where the seam and the edging of the form had been. And for this, I had to get a little tricky. So I made a little well on the side from tuck tape and just filled that with a little epoxy tinted to match. So this point is where things are gonna get a little bit crazy because of the fact that we embedded the table base in the resin top. However, because the table base is embedded in the resin top, there's no way to sand and polish the bottom of the table. So we're gonna be trying something completely new to me and something I'm not sure I've seen anyone else do before. We're gonna be pouring a layer of tabletop epoxy on the bottom of the table. And then the plan was to either sand and polish the top or put another layer of tabletop on the top of the top. And I figured I could just make that decision after we'd poured the epoxy coat on the bottom of the table. See, this stuff is super thick. As I was using a torch to get the bubbles out of the epoxy, I was starting to get a bit worried because there were way more bubbles than I'd ever really seen in a tabletop pour before. I spent about an hour and a half trying to get as many out as I could, but at this point, all I could really do was leave it and see what would happen. It needs to be that bad. Look at that, you see that? Um, it's really bad. This is not gonna be a $5,000 table. This is a, dude, look how bad it is. You see them? Do you see that like, thin layer of bubbles there? Yes, I do see some bubbles, but I don't think, I don't think it's like ruined. I can see it from here. There's no way to get rid of those at this point. No. I'll come back to explain why we got those bubbles in the bottom layer, but first I got to figure out how to get the top of the table perfectly clear. And this decision actually became easy after I saw those micro bubbles on the bottom because in effect, this is now an experimental build. So I decided to do another tabletop epoxy pour on the top of the table. Of course, doing a flood coat of tabletop epoxy on a table is nothing new in and of itself, but doing the two pours, the bottom and the top, I've just never seen anyone do that. The likely reason being because the drips that happen when you do a tabletop pour make it very challenging to get all four sides covered. But I've had an idea about how to do this for a while and this was the perfect opportunity to try it out. And as for why those micro bubbles got trapped in the bottom layer, well, I think the answer is pretty simple. I used a paddle on a power drill to mix the first tabletop pour, and that introduced way more bubbles than mixing by hand, which I did the second time around. Tabletop is a bit thicker epoxy, so if you introduce too many bubbles, they're just never going to come out. Bottom line, don't use a power mixer for tabletop. Now, at the end of the day, the micro bubbles in the bottom are super small. I probably could have published this video and never said anything and you wouldn't have noticed. They're so small, they kind of just give the top a frosted look. However, this was a pretty costly mistake as it originally planned to sell the table for about $5,000 to $6,000. And because it doesn't live up to the standards I think you need to have for that type of price point, I'll end up selling this at a much lower price point as an experimental piece. Now, as for dealing with the drips, I'm using a silicone squeegee to wipe all those off. But that isn't quite enough because the squeegee will smear epoxy around on the underside of the table, which you'll see through the clear top. So what I had to do was just really carefully come back with a microfiber cloth and a little bit of acetone to wipe off any excess epoxy left by the squeegee. And I had to keep repeating this process every 30 minutes or so for about three or four hours after the pour until the epoxy got firm enough that the drips stopped. 
Well, it looks like the table is text approved. If you guys like it too and think that I've earned it, greatly appreciate if you sub and bell. And for those of you waiting for the final reveal tour in the building renovation series, you might've noticed some changes in the studio here. We're working on all the final details so that the building is beautiful for the tour. That will be coming soon. That's it for this time, and I'll see you guys next time.